Hello, and welcome to the Big H Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Heiss, and today I've got Jim Smith, longtime resident of the Village of Hilton. Jim, it is great to have you with us. All righty, all righty, and I know the difference. Um, I would like to start off with what's a day in the life of, of you right now? Uh Typically, uh, I live on a, one of the family farms, uh, do a lot of outdoor activities, uh, if in the right season, gardening some of the rest of the time, uh, chopping and stacking wood, and uh, or we're traveling. Oh, very nice. What's, what's the last place you travel to? Uh, we just came back from a trip from uh, Nashville and Memphis. Oh, sweet. Um were you visiting friends or was it just that part was vacation and then on the way back we stopped in Virginia where our other son lives. Okay. All right. Well, so very good. Another grandson. Another grandson. Uh well let's go back a little bit about your family, uh your parents, where you grew up, that type of thing. Well, uh when I was a kid, I grew up on a farm on Bennett Road, which is borders the the north end of the high school mm -hmm. and uh lived there until i went off to college and got a job and uh, a few later years later i came back and bought the other family homestead and that's where i've been living for almost 45 years mm, good long time and your in your parents what were their names uh my father was faye william f-a-h-y and my low mother was lois burdett um and were they farmers or what What did they do for occupations? Well, uh, obviously my father grew up on, literally, he was literally born in the house I live in. Uh, so he grew up there, uh, went off uh, to Alford and got a degree in glass technology and then uh, worked for Bausch and Lomb during uh, World War II in their defense business and shortly thereafter uh, he and my grandfather had already gone into the milk business and in 1946 my father became a full-time milkman and we did everything we uh, raised the cows milked the cows bottled the milk and delivered it to your door oh very nice and uh, my mother is from an old family in the southern tier uh, though they really weren't that close during college, they were both at Alfred at the same time. Uh, she had a unique career in uh, at Sibley's before the war and then uh, joined the Red Cross and uh, was one of the first females uh, with the U.S. Uh, to get into Europe during World War II. Oh, wow. And uh, she... Uh, was there until late 1946 uh, because of the transportation of the, the day. Uh, a lot of boys didn't come home. Mm -hmm. uh, for several years, they were convalescing in uh, Europe. And then she came home and was inspired what she saw and went and got her master's degree in occupational therapy. And then friends from college put them together and... <laughs> They got married and came out to Parma and raised a family. Do you have any siblings? Uh, I had uh, uh, I, I had three brothers. I have one brother uh, still with us. He actually lives in the Bennett Road farm. Mm -hmm. And then I have uh, sisters that were twins. Okay. And were they identical or fraternal? Uh, very much fraternal. <laughs> very much. <laughs> I only ask because I'm a fraternal twin myself. Yeah. Um, so far, a lot of farm life within your family. Yes. Um, both uh, uh, on this, my grandmother's side, uh, Richard Sands came to the town of Parma in uh, 1822. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, don't know exact timeline, he... Uh, uh, purchased the farm where I live now and built the house that I live in. And then my grandfather, Stanley Smith, 
his uh, family uh, was here very, very early. I don't know the exact date, but his his great grandfather, uh, John Smith, who was born in 1797. Uh, built a house at the very west end of Parma on Curtis Road. Um, and certainly in the beginning, it was all farming. Uh, I think my father was one of the first that went and got a college education, uh, but then came back to farming. Mm -hmm. um, but most everybody was a farmer at some point. Uh, my grandmother's brothers, who were significantly older than her, uh, they ended up, uh, just because the farm wasn't big enough, uh, they ended up uh, working in the salt mines down in the Watkins Glen area because mm -hmm. uh, there was like a 16-year difference. So they were almost grown and out of the house before my grandmother was born. You said you had two brothers. No, a brother. And I, my two older brothers have since passed. Okay. And what, what did they do? Were they, were they farmers? Farmers or? Um well, my, unfortunately, my one brother died just before his 21st birthday. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, he was working for Rochester products while he was, uh, finishing up, uh, night school for his, uh, uh, college degree. And then my older brother, um, he had a college degree and worked in a variety of industries. And then at some juncture, he, got into farming and then uh, went back to work in industry because sometimes farming is a pretty tough business financially. For sure. sure. Um, it, you were saying that uh, you raised cows and did the whole process from yes. milking to delivering. Yep. What was that like? Well, um, we had uh, what they call a herdsman who took care of the day-to-day -day responsibilities of feeding the cows, milking the cows, uh, whatnot. And then literally across my driveway, they would carry what they call 40 quart cans of milk over. And then we had a processing plant where it was filtered and pasteurized and chilled and put into glass bottles. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you had a walk-in cooler and built into inventory, and then uh, you'd deliver it. So we actually had a gentleman that ran the bottling plant for many years who lived across the street. And then my father did it. My brother did it. We were out of that part of the business before I was of age okay. to, to, to bottle milk. But I did deliver my first quart of milk when I was seven. So, <laughs> um, And then, you know, so we bottled milk, and when we delivered the milk and we had uh, one full-time driver and, and and my father. So we had three, when I was at young, we had three routes. And as more and more people went to the supermarket, uh, the routes got a little leaner and leaner and uh, they were consolidated into two uh, units. And we went from three, three day deliveries a week to two two-day delivery weeks, uh, deliveries a week, just because that was, the, as the market shrank, mm -hmm. um, we did that. At your peak time, how many dairy cows did your farm have? Probably maybe 40, 45. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in those days, it was, it was almost pretty big doings. Mm -hmm. uh, there were... There was one person over in Hamlin that had maybe 170 uh, cows that they milk, mm -hmm. um, but it's nothing like the factory farms mm -hmm. today. And then we would go and pick up milk from other people that had very small herds, 10, 12 cows, and we would pick up from like three other farmers mm -hmm. and then bring all of that milk back and bottle it. Yeah, and forgive me for the ignorant question. They did you have uh, machines that would milk the cows, or? Well, uh, we had machines in that um, a small stainless steel container uh, with literally four suction cups, for lack of a better word, uh, was attached to an individual cow, and that milk went into the, the stainless steel 
uh, bucket was driven uh, by a vacuum system. Okay. And then that mount was dumped into the 40 quart milk can. So each cow was milked basically individually. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but that was probably state of the art, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, because I'm talking about, you know, probably uh, late 40s and then, you know, in early 50s mm -hmm. uh, was probably state of the art. And mm -hmm. then, and then obviously the bigger milk milk bottling bottling plants kind of put the little guys out of business. Right. What type of acreage did did your farmland own? Um, the farm I grew up on Bennett Road was probably was pretty much still intact. Is it was probably eighty acres because uh, my brother lives there. And then uh, at peak, uh, probably my farm was a little over a hundred acres. Now okay. it's about ninety. Okay. Because they sold five acres to uh, the eldest boy, and uh, city folk wanted a bigger backyard, so we sold some land off. Right, right. Um, giving it back to your uh, education, did you grow up in the village and, and go through K through six education there? Or I went you? through K through twelve at Hilton Central. Okay, so I did did you know did Hazel Jenkins for a couple of years. Went to Jonathan Underwood when it was brand new. Uh, went to Mert Williams when it was brand new. And then finished up at what's now the Quest School, the old, the original high school on West Avenue. Mm -hmm. And what year did you graduate? From? 1971. 1971. What was the time period like at that point in the village of Hilton or just life in general? Like, Well, I, I think it was... I call it calm. I think it was mm -hmm. pretty calm. We were, we were coming, becoming more and more a bedroom community, uh, you know, with people working at Kodak and Xerox and Bausch and Lam. Uh, you know, there was still a fair number of farmers with small acreage. You know, now the few farmers that are left are much larger acres or they rent a, a, the land. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, I guess, you know, it was a good place to grow up, I thought. Mm -hmm. um, not not a lot of controversy. Mm -hmm. Were you involved in any, any clubs or any activities, or what was going on? Well, in in school, I was, uh, interestingly enough, involved in a rifle club, something mm -hmm. that people would go probably bonkers to know <laughs> that there was uh, guns on school property. Um, and I was on a wrestling team. And uh, was fairly active in the Map Baptist Church, uh, you know, in through my teens. Mm -hmm. Probably some other clubs that I can't think of right now. Yeah, I had I talked to Ken Freeman on another podcast, and he had brought up the um, rifle club too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the wrestling team. Do you remember who your coach was back then? Uh, Al Crotts. Al Crotts. Okay, know him well. He was there when I was going through in the uh, mid to late eighties. And then you also said you were active in your Baptist church. Yeah, not super active, mm -hmm. but you know we had a youth group, and uh, you know that's where probably Nancy and I became friends because mm -hmm. uh, we were both fairly active in the church at mm -hmm. that particular point. And and besides the few the couple clubs you mentioned, uh, were there any um, courses or classes work that you started solidifying? You know, this could be my interest for my life. Well, I uh, was thinking about being a lawyer, and then I took Latin, and that <laughs> changed my attitude a lot. And then I became very interested in the environment and uh, started working towards a degree. It didn't come out exactly as an environmental degree, but uh, uh, after two years at MCC, I went to the University of Buffalo and got a civil engineering degree. And uh, moved back home for a little while, sold uh, pneumatic and hydraulic equipment, uh, and then I uh, got a job and I spent a little over two years in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, in the industrial uh, water treatment business. Uh, and then had an opportunity to move back to Parma, buy the farm, and uh, Changed companies, but the same, you know, same field, 
and I worked for that company for 31 years and retired. And um, then other people hired me to work part time, and I set up my own little consulting company mm -hmm. uh, and did that. And uh, was involved in uh, Parma Town Hall and uh, retired from everything about six years ago. Okay. So, and when did you meet your wife? You met her in high school then? No, uh, I met her um, while I was going to college. Uh, turns out that we both ended up working for the fast food chain called Carol's. Mm -hmm. uh, we met, uh, but I was at MCC and was going on to University of Buffalo. So we, uh, so we say, drifted apart mm -hmm. for a number of years and then... Uh, that gal had actually stood up for us at our wedding, put us back together. So, so I've known her a long time. Mm -hmm. And she graduated the same year from school from Hilton. Uh, no, she, she she was a city girl. Okay, uh, she uh, graduated. So the school that school doesn't exist anymore, but she graduated from Nazareth High School. Okay. Now you said you uh, you ended up being a civil engineer. Can you describe to me a little bit about what a civil engineering is? Well, not that I did a lot of it, but this a, a true civil engineer does a lot of work with infrastructure, whether it's building bridges, building buildings, uh, building uh, well, water treatment plants, which was sort of what attracted me to it. So I sort of was in the water side, not building buildings or building roads. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of math, a lot of things went like that in the, the business. There was some basic chemistry for water treatment that I studied in college, and you know, then I went on to use a lot of that mm -hmm. in my prof professional life. And what what was the UB like when you were going through? Well, Good I, memories of that place. Well, or? excellent memories of that place. Uh, sort of got there, be as the activists of the the Vietnam era was really dying down. So it was from that kind of standpoint, it was relatively calm and uh, quiet. I was very active in, in college and uh, had a great time. <laughs> That's what college is for. Uh, now you said you were active or involved in the Parma town hall. Yes. Describe that a little bit. Well, uh, Again, back to sort of my interest in uh, the environment, uh, in the very, very early stages of recycling, there were no programs. Mm -hmm. So I ended up being uh, the head of the Parma Recycling Committee, and we really tried to come up with ways to encourage people to recycle their oil, uh, their newspapers, magazines, other things, and try to come up with collection points because it was, you know, if you didn't do it, it didn't get done. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a blue box at the side of the road. Mm -hmm. It was you had to physically take it someplace. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then uh, sort of based on that, I got sort of people in uh, the town government interested in what I had to bring. And uh, so I served on the Parma planning board uh, for 12 years. And basically the planning board looks at the plans for development, whether it's a single home or a development. Uh, we would review, look at the plans, not so much the interior of the house, but what was that development going to do to the land in the area? Was it going to have a negative or positive impact on the neighbors as far as drainage and things like that? Mm -hmm. um, and then after 12 years of that, I ran for the Parma Town Board and initially was on the town board for eight years. And then I ran for supervisor, was a supervisor for four years. So I was technically a member of the Parma Town Board for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And if I go back to um, when you were in charge of the Parma Recycling Commission, yes, what was that like trying to bring people along and getting them to have buy into what you were thinking? Um, 
there were people that were very interested and very happy to do whatever they could. Mm -hmm. And then there were the people that just didn't care. Mm -hmm. And some you could win over and some you couldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was, it was as much as trying to make it as easy and convenient as possible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because that was still in a day where a lot of people changed their own oil. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we had developed a couple of collection sites. Um, you know, some of it was just, uh, you know, a garage. It would, you know, take the oil back and, and recycle it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the paper products that we buy today, or even then, were made from recycled paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that would reduce the number of trees that had to come down to make mm -hmm. paper. Mm -hmm. You know, and then glass at that point was fairly easy because we had Owens, Illinois, out in Brockport, right. a glass plant. So right. that's where we would get glass together and 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 take it over there, and, and they would make more glass out of it. Mm -hmm. So you were really involved in, I guess, can, the planning board, it's considered government, right? Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. And uh, 12 years on the Parma planning board, did you... For 12 years of your life, that's a long time. So you must have enjoyed it, right? Yes. It, it was nice to, to be involved. It was nice to know what was going on. Uh, and, you know, at that point, Parma was growing uh, with a lot of new homes and developments. And one of the things that got me interested in the planning board was some of the developments were taken prime farmland. Mm hmm out of production mm -hmm. and legally you can't do anything really to stop it. But it was the idea was let's, you know, do as little harm as we can mm -hmm. uh, to the environment and stack the original development that got me going is still farmland. Mm -hmm. uh, and then other, you know, areas, uh, you know, have got housing developments. Mm -hmm. It seems like we're continuing to grow. Yeah, it, it it sort of amazes me, not just in Parma, but around Monroe County, is that supposedly the county's population growth is relatively flat. Mm -hmm. So who's buying all these houses? Right. And I don't know that. Right. Obviously, somebody's buying them because they're building them. <laughs> exactly. And then uh, you mentioned that uh, you're on the town board for eight years. What? led you to be on the town board and, and, and like maybe the, the differences between on, being on a planning board versus the town board? Well, the, the planning board focus was fairly narrow, right? Uh, the town board really covered really almost everything going on in the town of Parma that wasn't a village of Hilton. Um, Cause they have their own separate governmental entity. And there was a little bit of county uh, infrastructure because about a third of the roads in the town of Parma are state-owned, but a third are owned by Monroe County, and about a third or a third is owned by the town of Parma. Mm -hmm. And so the Parma maintains those roads, whether it's fixing them or plowing the snow. Uh, interesting, uh, the county hires the town of Parma to do odd jobs and plow the snow on the county roads. The state has its own interesting model. Uh, 259, which you live on, is a state road, and the town of Parma is hired by the state of New York to plow that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they won't hire us to do maintenance. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, uh, the New York State Parkway is maintained completely snow removal, whatever, by state employees. Um, so there's a lot of interaction that way. Um, uh, we, you know, we have a huge recreation department. Mm -hmm. uh, the town board is responsible for selecting members of the planning board, the zoning board, uh, the recreation commission, the library board. Uh, kind of all of those things fall under uh, the purview of the, the town board. Obviously, you know, we have to develop a budget. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, sometimes we have to raise taxes. Sometimes mm -hmm. we, we don't. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to present a budget to the town. First, we approve it as a town board. And then uh, we present it to the town. We give them an opportunity uh, for a budget hearing. Um, obviously, controversy brings a lot of people to town board meetings. And mm -hmm. lack of controversy means there's nobody there. Right. Um, so we do that. Um, and I really, you know, other than, you know, the times where you had irate citizens or irate employees it was very enjoyable mm -hmm. and uh, and i enjoyed it uh, you know i used to take on projects to and going back to my environmental and engine and energy uh uh background from work um, i got a grant to replace the boiler at town hall from something that was uh to replace something that was very very inefficient uh, upgraded um, the air conditioning system uh, and, and saved the town a fair amount of money and mm -hmm. energy and was able to get grants uh, from the state of New York, which helped, you know, cover that big upfront cost. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, you kind of, that was going to be my next question was like, what are some of your key accomplishments that you felt you did as a member of the town board? Uh, yeah, probably projects related to um, saving energy, protecting the environment, um, trying to come up, up with ways to, to get things fixed that, uh, you know, were, were cost effective. You know, interestingly enough, uh, you know, the, the, the state wants, you know, is, wants competitive wage rates and uh you know there's times you can get the job done with local contractors mm -hmm. at a significantly uh better value mm -hmm. but the prevailing wage wage rate uh sometimes by the state um kind of prevented you from doing that mm -hmm. which i thought was a little crazy um but I think those were, were were the big things. Uh we had really never had a formal process for employee evaluations. Mm -hmm. Um and tried to uh uh get that going um so that uh people knew what was expected of them and uh you could evaluate them and kind of learn from them and you know uh, because there was a lot of, lot of different departments and it was a way of kind of learning what's going on because we had a building department, we have a dog control, we have an assessor's office, we have a town clerk's office. Obviously we have a financial office. We, uh, um, did a couple of upgrades cause we also have a court, mm -hmm. um, that takes care of anywhere from minor infractions to, um, the deputies will arrest somebody for a crime and bring them into mm -hmm. town hall. And the, one of the two town judges would arraign them and determine if they were being remanded to custody, uh, given an appearance ticket or whatever. And then depending on the severity of the charges, uh, they could be tried in, in the town parma, but, a, a more serious crime, the, 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 the county would take over. Okay. And then you served as supervisor for four years. Is that the one term? Is that one term? For no, four there, years? it's a two, two, two years. Okay. And then what, what brought you to the point where I think I want to take on a supervisory supervisor job? Uh, much of it was driven by a, a political need because we had some warring factions mm -hmm. within uh, town government. And uh, a number of people thought that I would be a good calming influence. And uh, so I ran. Uh, I told them I would do two two-year terms, but I had said I would only run for town board for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up going an extra two. Mm -hmm. and, and what was your tenure like as town supervisor? 
for the most part, I, I thought it was very, very good. Uh, it's interesting, you know, some of the problems the citizens come to you with. Uh, you know, the more amazing one is the, the people that couldn't get along with their neighbor. Mm -hmm. And they thought a supervisor, I could fix that. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't work that way. Right. Um, but again, it was, you know, there was a lot of different agencies you had to work with that were outside of town. So, you know, I would go to meetings, whether it was with the county, uh, the state, uh, to try to, you know, work out different things, try to get, you know, sometimes it's try to get grant money. Uh, sometimes it was try to convince the state to be a little more efficient. Um, because why bring a crew out from, I think, their main facilities up on, excuse me, Jefferson Road mm -hmm. in the city, or actually Henrietta, why bring them out for a minor road repair mm -hmm. when the town of Parma's highway department could do that work mm -hmm. and, you know, probably charge the state less money than they were going to shell out. Right. And they were very protective because they felt their guys needed to work in the summer. And so, but I mean, I went literally to Albany once to kind of fight that battle. And mm -hmm. I did not win. <laughs> hey, you got to try. Yeah, you got to try. So, you know, growing up, maybe your high school, slightly out of high school, what were some of those early jobs you had? Or were you pretty much tied to dad and grandpa on the well, farm? Well, um, probably worked on the farm one way or another uh, up through literally, you know, part-time as it would have been up through college graduation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mostly I was in the part of the business that delivered milk. Mm -hmm. um, I had bad allergies in those days. So up close and personal with the cows was really something that didn't go well. Right. Um, so, uh, I mostly worked on the dairy side of, of the business. Uh, and then, you know, for part-time I worked, well, then it was called the big M, but I worked mm -hmm. in the grocery store. And then in college, I worked for the Carol's, which is where I met my wife to be. Um, and, uh, worked at some other, uh, you know, worked at a deli in Spencerport. Um, and then uh, kind of worked my way through college with mm -hmm. different odd jobs. Mm -hmm. And so you, <clears throat> your wife's name is Nancy, correct? No. My wife's name is Jeanette. My bad. Yeah. I'm sorry. When I said Nancy, I was talking about <laughs> Nancy that got me here. Gotcha. Um, so Nancy Laporte? Yes. Okay. No, we're yeah. well. Um, oh, where was I going with that? Um, your your personal family. uh your own children. How many children do you have? Uh, three boys. Um, two live locally, one very locally. Um, one lives in Virginia, and I have uh, five grandkids. So the the two that are locally, you said one is. Wait, I can see his house <laughs> you can see from his... my backyard, my deck. <laughs> uh, yeah, he built a log house on what was part of the farm and uh he has two little kids and then the youngest brother um is uh youngest boy is out in webster mm -hmm. and he has two kids okay and then the middle brother is in virginia okay. very good now uh, nancy when she got you in touch with me you had said that your family is one of the earliest settlers of parma I'm going to kind of leave it open with, to you as to, you know, what do you recall about your family tree and landmarks around Hilton that are in the Smith clan? Well, um, my great, great grandfather, Richard Sands moved to Parma. I think I mentioned in 1822, mm -hmm. eventually purchased the farm I live on, uh, built the house I live in. And, uh, I, I think in those days, uh, pretty much a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. uh, there was parts of uh, the farm that had different orchards on them. Uh, obviously, we raised cows for milk. Uh, 
cattle for meat and slaughter. We had, you know, they had hogs and chickens. A lot of that was gone, you know, before I had much of any recollection. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, John Smith, who is the first Smith that I can track into the town of Parma, was sort of on the west most border of Parma and I think even had agricultural interests in Hamlin uh, in there. And then, uh, to the best of my knowledge, everybody was really pretty much into at least, you know, the direct, uh, my direct ancestors were pretty much tied to agriculture. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a Smith Cemetery in the area? There is a Smith Cemetery. Uh, where is it? Well, there's uh, a Smith Cemetery uh, and another name that's down at the intersection of North Avenue and uh, Dunbar Road. Mm -hmm. That one's, and I don't know how many, I have very few ancestors uh, buried there. Uh, a lot of my sand side of the family, my father's side of the family is at Parma Union Cemetery. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of my grandfather's uh, Stanley Smith, uh, his ancestors were mostly buried in Hamlet because there was a fair, you know, there was a, a disconnect. Uh, I don't know if the disconnect is the right word. A mm -hmm. Connection with Hamlin. A lot of uh, the Smith wives came from people that lived in Hamlin. So mm -hmm. we had a number of people that, you know, if I go another generation back, um, were, were Hamlin. Mm -hmm. And though I don't know that they were related because I can't do, I haven't done as much uh, cross checking, but uh, on two different sides of the family, uh, the the maiden names of the women were Curtis. Mm -hmm. And then we have Curtis Road. Curtis Road, yep. Um, and there were a lot of Curtises in the area at that time, and I don't know really which ones I was related to. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I, you know, we had John Smith, Marcelin, Andrew Stanley, my grandfather, and Faye, my father. So there was, before you even got to me, there was five generations of Parma men. I know I was looking in Leah Wright's book and in the index, and Smith is about this law. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to let Jim handle all that. <laughs> well, and interestingly <laughs> enough, um, my grandparents, which were Smiths by, by marriage, they had two kids, my father and my aunt. So, again, a small family. My mother's parents were the same way. She had one brother. And, uh, and then my grandmother grew up in a house with six. Um, and then some of the other families were two and three members. Mm -hmm. So we never had the huge footprint that some of the other families mm -hmm. I know where they have 10 or 12 kids. Mm -hmm. Um, so we didn't, there's not a lot of Smiths. I mean, right now, the only Smith related to me that I know of is my brother over in Bennett Road. Right. Um, uh, people laughed at my graduating, uh, class at 71. I think they paraded 13 Smiths up to the podium and two girls were related. That Just was it. A, that's amazing. I mean, that's, amazing. you know, and so he goes, and people were giggling, ah, oh, another Smith. And right. I said, you know, I said, we aren't related. Right. So, uh, and there's no sands around, mm -hmm. you know, so when my grandma, when her siblings moved away, they didn't come back. Um, and um, obviously, my grandmother's changed her name to Smith. Mm -hmm. um, so the Sands family had a, had a, a long run, and then it stopped. Mm -hmm. Any of your family descendants um, war war veterans? Well, I had um, trying to think on my father's side. Um, I'm not so sure on my mother's side. Uh, we had people fighting the French and Indian War, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War One. I, I think the Spanish-American War. 
Um, I think my mother was the only one that served uh, in World War II. Um, my aunt, my father's sister, my her husband served over in Europe mm -hmm. uh, during World War II. Uh, but we, we kind of got covered in a lot of the very, very early battles, like I said, starting with the French and Indian War. Mm -hmm. I had a, he was a young man, or actually probably more a boy, down where my mother is from in uh, the southern tier. Uh, he went out one day and disappeared. Mm -hmm. And they went out looking for, you know, his body. Mm-hmm. And uh, seven years later, he showed up knocking at the door. Oh, my. Native Americans had taken him prisoner mm -hmm. because the, uh, by the French, because the English were paying for scalps. Okay. And he was too young, so he didn't count. Wow. So he survived, you know, the French and Indian War and was, uh, I guess you, the word is repatriated. Uh, I think from out, he was in, in Montreal. Mm -hmm. uh, where he was being held and then got released and found his way back home. Must be something. You think you've lost a member of your family oh, yeah. seven years later. Wow. Here he is. And, you know, he looked, yeah, he looked more Indian than, you know, than the rest of his family. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just sort of a very interesting little side saga. Mm -hmm. Are there any uh, streets or historical markers named after your family in Parma? Not that I'm aware of, because mm -hmm. Smith. I, well, I don't. I don't believe Smith Street in a village would have been named after my family because we were, you know, out outside of the village. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, it'd probably be a stretch to say, you know, one of my ancestors was how Curtis Road got its name. Right. It, it's possible, but right. um, you know, but I'm not aware of any. Uh, Actually, I've tried to promote getting my great grandfather recognized by a street mm -hmm. name someday, but it hasn't worked out so well. And that great grandfather's name was Smith Richard or? Sands. Richard Sands. Okay. Yes. Now you said you retired officially six years ago, was it? Yes. And how you've been keeping yourself busy? Um, either around the farm or traveling. Mm -hmm. uh, we've made trips to Europe and Africa. Um, oh, wow. And uh, we've got a couple more trips planned. We've got good friends that travel everywhere, and they try to drag us along. But mm -hmm. We don't know about every other trip with them. Um, but uh, so, yeah, we do travel, and then we have a camper. And, uh, you know, we've been to Texas with a camper. We've been to Florida. Hopefully, Memorial Day weekend, we head for a month-long trip that will get us out to uh, Mount Rushmore and back mm -hmm. with the camper. And then hopefully we're going to uh, the Grand Canyon in the fall. Oh, exciting. And then in between that, uh, the family has had a place up in the St. Lawrence River for many, many, many years. And I try to get up there whenever I can. Mm -hmm. Well, you always come back to your roots in Hilton. You have no desire to relocate or anything like that? No, I don't really have. I mean, to maybe go someplace in the winter more extensively, but we're not Florida people. We mm -hmm. proved that sort of ourselves. We stayed uh, outside of Tampa for a month in our camper, mm -hmm. uh, and it just didn't excite us, you know, mm -hmm. the traffic and whatnot. Uh, we're looking at maybe doing some camping in Georgia and uh, Alabama next 2025 winter, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether or not that would get us. But, you know, right now, you know, four out of five grandkids are in very close driving proximity mm -hmm. and we're very, very close with them. So uh, even going away for a month, my wife gets an itch. Mm -hmm. So us going to, you know, someplace for even a few months, I don't think we would do it. But I like good old Parma Hilton. Me too. Uh, and I said, a lot of your career or interest was around environmental. How do you think Parma Hilton is doing now with, with energy and energy savings and efficiency and all that? I mean, this is more of an opinion question, I guess, but it seems like you're very knowledgeable about it. Well, um, we certainly have seen 
more solar development in the town. I tried to do a project on some, what I will call wasteland, um, but the, there was some concerns about liability uh, of, of taking over the responsibility for that kind of property. Mm -hmm. So the town didn't uh, build an, a solar farm there. And then we were, I was going to build one at the back corner of uh, the town park. And it turns out the lowest, closest utility lines weren't rated for a solar farm. So yeah. that, and to upgrade them would have been on the, on Parma's, you know, budget. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we try to do things uh, to keep, you know, waste out of uh, our, our water streams, uh, you know, where there's might be a storm sewer or something, you know, some of them we've, we've literally marked, you know, don't dump oil. It's amazing what people will do to get rid of their waste motor mm -hmm. oil. Mm -hmm. um, even though, you know, garages and quick lube places, they're legally obligated to take it. Mm -hmm. You know, people will still do dumb stuff. Mm -hmm. So we try to make that as inconvenient as possible, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, to do that, but we really, uh, you know, only have a, a little industry. Uh, what would have been the big industry from an environmental standpoint was when we did have dairy farms. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even a small farm uh, could generate a lot of waste. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, uh, you know, I felt we managed it in an environmentally friendly way because we had <clears throat> sort of that balance of acreage and herd size where the manure could be spread safely, you know, on, you know, the farm property. Mm -hmm. uh, the bigger factory farms, you know, the ones that have 2,000 head, uh, that's a huge environmental issue. And, uh, and we don't have to, that to deal with our last couple of large dairy farms have since closed mm -hmm. um and, and we did have one that was a bit of a challenge and uh and that probably did slow down the retirement of mm -hmm. the last generation and right going from there and so I, I don't know that we've had you know like i said other than some drainage issues and things like that uh we haven't had huge environmental issues that we've had. Mm -hmm. so you stayed around here your whole life. What does Hilton offer today? Do you think if you, if, you know, we got the people come in for a carnival, let's say, what would you tell that person? Like, this is what this village and town. Provide. Well, uh, I still think it's, you know, even in, as crazy as the world is, it's a pretty safe place to live. I mean, it's only been a few years that we've really routinely started locking our doors at night. Mm -hmm. Rest of the day, our house is wide open. Mm -hmm. People just walk in. Um, so I think it's a pretty safe place uh, to, you know, you, you you can, you know, take your kids to the park, uh, kind of let them run somewhat free. Mm -hmm. and a lot of activities, uh, you know. Whether it's village managed or uh, Parma Recreation is sort of one of the areas where we're uh, very much collaborative. Uh, most of the village uh, recreation activities are actually managed by the town of Parma. Mm -hmm. uh, so the community center, which is at Henry Street, um, that was a brand new school that my father went to. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. It's owned by the village, uh, but Parma rents space there for our recreational mm -hmm. activities. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a joint recreation committee, four members of the village, four members of the town, mm -hmm. so that we can, you know, collaborate um, on that. I mean, they have a very active food shelf that is for, for Parma and, and, and Hilton residents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think. The school system 
uh, is really good. I think it served me well. Um, yeah. and, and I think it's, it's, it, I think it had a little dip of a couple of decades ago and I think they've rebounded nicely. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think you could bring your kids here and be happy here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you like driving around and less and less open space, but right. there's still a lot of <coughs> open space. Right. And, uh, you know, again, part of the town uh, board philosophy is to, to try to manage that. You know, if we're going to have a development, let's try to get it together and not, hodgepodge here hodgepodge there mm -hmm. um you know trying to where practical minimize you know some of the uh infrastructure that would attract you know developments mm -hmm. um so because a lot of people say they come to town you know town of parma for the rural atmosphere and then when somebody builds a house in their backyard they get all upset <laughs> Says you should have bought the land. Right. Nobody liked that answer. Right. <laughs> Nobody liked that answer. You don't want anybody in your backyard? Buy it. Right. Um what do you think is gonna be your family's legacy? Well, I'd like to think we were and will continue to be good stewards of the land. Mm -hmm. Uh you know, I hope that a generation from now, two generations from now. Uh, my farm will still be farmed. Um, you know, hopefully where my brother lives, it'll still be farmed. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, so I, I think that might be, you know, the biggest legacy, you know. You know, hopefully I get a little chunk for trying to serve the community in a broad sense. And, uh, but I think, Promote an open space would be mm -hmm. the biggest legacy. Very noble. Very noble. Um, you kind of already answered. I was going to ask you three words to describe Hilton. Then you said safe, schools. Anything else you think on that? Well, I'd say calm. Right. It doesn't get too exciting around mm -hmm. here except maybe Carnival Week. <laughs> and then uh, these are just as, as we start to wrap up. Some fun things that I don't know. Maybe people don't know. I don't know. What's your? Do you have a favorite book of all time? Oh, favorite book. Um, maybe probably one. one I read a long, long time ago, which was Exodus, mm -hmm. written by Leon Uris, and it was really about the formation of this, this, this state of Israel. No kidding. And all of the trials and tribulations they went through, from literally getting from Europe to Israel, because there was literally pioneers that went in and, and started living there. And, and they actually cohabitated very well with their Muslim brothers. Uh, it really wasn't until, uh, I think, even in 1947, when the state of Israel was created, uh, a lot of outside uh, people got their two cents in and and, and led to the ongoing conflict that mm -hmm. has sort of festered for 53, 75 years. Mm -hmm. um, but that wow. was a great book. Um, any favorite movie? Oh, it's just chintzy, but I'd say Star Wars. That's all right. That's all right. All of them are just... Well, the original, you, you know, you always get props to the original. Right. But I think they've all... Uh, been great okay. you know they've all been great right. you know um, favorite quote most meaningful. you know i read that and i don't know you know i mean probably you know jfk's ask not what the, mm -hmm. your country can do for you well, what can you do for your country because mm -hmm. that's in some way that's how i've tried to mm -hmm. conduct my life a little bit anyway and i think when you said to be good stewards of the land i think that yeah. yeah. Um, favorite TV show, if you have one. Oh, there's so many. I watch way too much TV. Probably Blue Bloods on Friday night on uh -huh. CBS. Tom Selleck. Yeah. yeah. Um, got a favorite food? Wow. Probably. 
probably a good steak. Good steak? Yeah, good steak I can grill outside. So this is the winter I because I love to grill. Uh -huh. And another quick question. Favorite leisure activity? I don't know. You sounds like you do a lot of traveling, but is there something else you like to do to kick back and just relax? Well, I like to garden. The problem is my eyes are bigger than my brain. Mm -hmm. So I make a big, too big a garden because I don't have time with all our travels to keep it weeded properly. But, <laughs> but I, you know, I like to garden, you know, I, I got a, a granddaughter that likes to help me and uh, will can pickles and, you know, freeze some vegetables if mm -hmm. we can get a good harvest. Last year was a weird year. Um, right now I'm a little worried that I won't be able to plant because it's so wet out. Mm -hmm. Um, but I like gardening. You know, I've got a wood lot. I like to go down and tinker in. Um, right now I'm getting a ready, getting a boat ready to take up to, to camp. Mm -hmm. Um, so I like a little mechanical stuff, but mm -hmm. probably gardening and travel. Sounds good. Um, <clears throat> what do you want to be in five years? You had lived an accomplished life and you retired. I'd, I'd still like to be healthy enough to work on the farm and travel. Okay. But you know, it gets to be harder and harder, that's for sure. Right. Where do you think Hilton's going to be in five years? I'd like to think it's going to be kind of where it's at. Um, uh, I mean, there are a couple of large developments, you know, on the books um, for housing. Uh, I don't know how many more solar farms, mm -hmm. um, I guess because it saved the political war where we're in, interestingly enough, we're not in a, a prime location to put in a windmill farm. Mm -hmm. So we're probably never going to fight that battle. Mm -hmm. I could see maybe some more solar farms, mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's, it's, Probably the biggest driver will be the politics really around maybe the school and where the school is or isn't. Because mm -hmm. um, it's, it's the largest employer in town by quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly drives the economy mm -hmm. in a different fashion. So I think the school district's going to have an impact on the community, hopefully for the better. Great answer. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Because I'm a teacher, I work yeah. in it. Um, here's another one I ask guests. Three people from history that you'd like to have dinner with, if you could bring them back. Wow. Well, probably Abraham Lincoln be first. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're going back a lot further. Um, somebody maybe not a crazy uh, choice to people would think of would be uh, – Dwight Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a very interesting political and uh, military career. Mm -hmm. and he probably was the last th that I know of, true, based on what I know about, you know, the true, true gentleman uh, politicians that, you know, sort of, again, you know, was committed to, to try to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And who would number three be? Probably somebody like Golda Meir because, uh, you know, she kind of broke that glass ceiling mm -hmm. uh, and, and then literally had to fight a war uh, to keep Israel alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, she was, they, I just watched a movie on her and mm -hmm. she pretty much chain smoked herself into an early grave. <laughs> um, anything I didn't ask that, you know, maybe you were expecting me to or I didn't follow up on? Um, I don't know really because there's some some questions I'm still trying to answer. You know, uh, the fact that my grandfather and my father went into this partnership in the milk business by buying somebody else's dairy. Um, now did they originally bottle the milk there, or when did they bottle? Because I don't have any, you know, the questions you didn't ask your parents when you should have right. is, is when did some of these pieces come together? Uh -huh. uh, because uh, 
while my father was going to college and when he first was in industry, my grandfather, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, with obviously some help from my father, ran the business. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, when my father left Bausch and Lam, he ran the business. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's pieces in there I don't, you know, completely understand. I mean, I know that, like, during the Depression, because they were sort of a well-balanced agricultural unit, that they were able to hire a lot of people. I shouldn't say a lot, but they were able to hire people that had no place to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of their pay was... My grandmother fed them lunch as mm-hmm. their main was, you know, it really was dinner. Mm-hmm. It was their, you know, main meal. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I, you know, they didn't have really any money. My father had to borrow money to go to college. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think that they ever went hungry, mm-hmm. which not everybody could say during the Depression. Mm-hmm. And they were able to help out people. Mm-hmm. And, and unfortunately, I don't know enough about. Other than my grandfather, I don't know a lot about the other, the Smith side of the mm-hmm. family, other than they were sort of on the Parma Hamlin border farming. Mm-hmm. I don't know an awful lot about that. In fact, I was surprised to find out maybe less than 10 years ago that my great great grandfather built this house over in the corner of Curtis mm-hmm. and Town Line Road. You know, I just saw this old house. Mm-hmm. It's been refurbished by the people that live there now. It looks brand new. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of it. Well, I've enjoyed listening to you. I think a couple of things struck me about being servants of the land. And I think just what you were finishing up with by saying, I wish I knew a little bit more. It inspires me to maybe ask the questions now of my Yes. Ancestors yeah. and descendants. So yeah. I've got something to pass along to yes. my kids. If, if you have living relatives that are one or two generations, ask questions because mm-hmm. I didn't ask enough. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Well, this has been uh, Mike Heis, your host with Jim Smith, and we'll be back with more episodes of the Big H podcast real soon. Stay tuned.